Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And of course, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's really a great pleasure and honor to speak here. As a member of the somewhat younger generation, I basically <laughs> grew up <laughs> on uh, Jean-Pierre's books and lecture notes. So it's really, really a great pleasure to be here today. So what I will talk about is mostly joint work with uh, um, uh, Jen Chun Chu and Ben Weinkov. So um, let me start. So there are essentially two problems or uh, questions that I want to address. So there are two, it's two, I'll just say two questions, which are related to the C11 in the title. So let's uh, first discuss the first one for a while and then go to the next one. So the first is the about geodesics in the space of killer metrics. So I think this one briefly appeared in Boo's talk, perhaps. But let me just uh, um, explain the setup. So um, x will be an n-dimensional compact killer manifold without boundary, a closed manifold. And uh, omega is the killer form. And uh, uh, suppose I have um, two smooth functions. such that um, if I do the killer form omega and I add the dd bar of, of phi, then I get still a strictly positive definite killer form. Right? So this notation means that this 1-1 one, one form uh, is positive definite in the usual sense. So killer form, killer forms. So of course, by the dd bar lemma, it's the same as saying that I pick two killer metrics in the same cohomology class as omega. Uh, then uh, smooth geodesic oops, geodesic segment connecting them, t0 and phi1, is defined to be a path, so phi t. So of course, phi0 and phi1 in the path are the same as these guys. So this would be, a, say, for example, smooth path in the space of smooth functions. So smooth in T, such that the, they all define oops, killer matrix omega T. And they solve the geodesic equation, which is the second time derivative of T minus this is the, the Keller metric GT, and then you take the inverse. And this is just the. So this is nothing but the, the gradient squared, the gradient squared of this phi t dot measure with respect to the metric GT itself, the complex gradient. Okay, so this. Why is it a geodesic? In which sense? So this is a, a just a formally a geodesic. Uh, formally, the geodesic equation for an, the L2 type Riemannian structure on the space of all such Keller metrics or Keller potentials, the space of all such fees. Which was, so this L2 metric is due to Mabuchi. who also wrote down the geodesic equation, and later um, uh, Donaldson and Sams independently also discovered this and more of what I'm going to say next. So um, this is just uh, um, what formally you get from this L2 structure. And uh, what, what Donaldson and Sams observed is that this uh, kind of nasty looking PDE is in fact equivalent to uh, much better looking uh, complex Mont-Jamper equation. So working on the product x cross an annulus. So here sigma, I would just take for convenience the annulus between 1 and e inside the complex plane. 
and uh, uh, the you can then pi is the projection and you let phi a function on the product say of x and z to be phi of log mod z of x so here phi t is a given given smooth path so this defines a smooth function smooth function on the product so then this uh, path phi t is a geodesic if and only if this equation star so uh, So if you pull back the killer form and you add the dd bar of this phi in all variables, it's semi-positive and the determinant is zero. This is on x cross sigma, on x cross sigma. And then the, the boundary data is given. So x in x. OK, so the, this one here is a homogeneous. So it's a Dirichlet problem for a homogeneous complex motion pair equation. Oops. On this uh, product product manifold with boundary. OK, if you take the closure, the closure of sigma has a boundary. And, uh, and the, so this condition here is essentially a plurisubharmonicity condition with respect to this degenerate form on the product. And this one here is the Mongeampere operator. n plus 1 is the complex dimension of x cross sigma. So this is the determinant in local coordinates. And the 0, it's why it's called homogeneous. Yeah. So the, um, maybe for simplicity, so I will need to use this many times. So I will just write instead something like phi restricted to the boundary equals to phi, where this little phi is going to be phi 0 on one component and phi 1 on the other one. This is phi 0 and phi 1. So I, I don't need to re keep rewriting this, which is kind of long. OK, so, the, um, so this, I believe, was observed by Donaldson and Sams. OK, and uh, especially uh, the work of Donaldson highlighted the importance of finding such geodesic segments. For example, uh, in the context of uh, proving uniqueness, eventually existence also of, of uh, canonical Keller metrics, Keller-Einstein or constant scalar curvature. So the, the constructing these geodesics was a very important problem. And uh, uh, ideally, Oh, can you actually read it? Maybe not. Ideally, you would like them to be smooth, as I wrote in the hidden line. <laughs> um, but since it's at least the fact that the equation is homogeneous uh, makes it harder to directly solve, directly solve it, uh, people first looked at weak solutions. So uh, weak geodesic segment. Again, joining this phi1 and phi2, phi0 and phi1 is going to be a function phi, let's say bounded function on this uh, x cross sigma. As you can put it up to the boundary, it doesn't matter, which is a uh, uh, pi star omega plurisubharmonic, which is just the, the, the first line of equation star in the, in the weak sense. And then uh, such that it has the, the third line, so such that this uh, okay, phi over the boundary is given. And then the, the, the intermediate line can be defined in the sense of Bedford-Taylor. So phi star omega plus dd bar phi in the weak sense of pluripotential theory as defined by Bedford and Taylor. So as it turns out, as I explained in one second, I won't actually need to explain what this means because um, these solutions will be actually more regular and you will be able to make sense of this essentially point-wise almost everywhere. And then it's just the usual point-wise almost everywhere. And uh, um, so 
the, if, you, if you take this uh, weaker definition, so a kind of a weak solution of star, this, you can think of it as a weak solution star, then uh, you can just write down the solution. There exists a unique such weak solution, which is given by the Perron Bremerman envelope. So phi, phi at the point, let's say x, or I should say x z, is the soup overall eta, which are pi star omega pluris of harmonic on x cross sigma, and the, the limb soup, let's say as x z, goes to the boundary, x0, z0 on the boundary of eta of xz is less than or equal than phi of x0, z0. So this is the, essentially mimic the, the, same, the same construction that you do for the Perron solution of uh, the Dirichlet problem for harmonic functions in one complex variable. You look at subharmonic functions which on the boundary are below the boundary data, and then take the soup. So this one here, it's a kind of simple exercise <laughs> to show that it is indeed a weak solution, and it's unique. Um, of course, it's not completely satisfactory since it's given by this big supremum, and it's not very easy to work with directly. And the key problem is uh, what is the regularity of this phi? So for example, can you choose phi to be smooth? So, uh, so the story or history is like this. So the, the, the first result was due to Chen in 2000, building upon earlier work of uh, Caffarelli, Kohn, Nirenberg, Sprach. In 85 maybe, and uh, Bo Guan in 99 or 98. And uh, later, some addendum by Bwotsky, Bwotsky is that uh, phi, as I said, is, uh, is bounded. And phi, in fact, actually, the i d d bar phi, so this is uh, in the whole x cross sigma variables, has L infinity coefficients on x cross sigma to the boundary. So, uh, in other words, this is in fact the same as the Laplacian of phi being bounded with respect to the obvious product metric on this guy. So uh, this, in his paper, is called a C11 <laughs> geodesic. Um, it's not exactly C11, because C11 means that the real Hessian has an infinity coefficients, while this one here is only the DD bar. So you are missing the anti-complex part of the Hessian. So this you can call some witty person call it a C11 bar geodesic. <laughs> it may be Boo, actually, I don't remember. So someone came up with this uh, funny name. Um, so the, this is the first positive result. You can call it a C11 bar geodesic. And the uh, um, oh, in particular, because the Laplacian is at infinity, by elliptic estimates, this implies that phi belongs to C1 alpha of x cross sigma for all alpha strictly less than 1. So you are almost C11, but maybe not quite. <laughs> and uh, on the negative side, the first result was by Lampert and Vivas in 2011 that uh, phi in general, is not C3. So uh, you cannot hope to obtain C infinity solution, not even C3. Uh, and uh, this is, if you want, slightly 
expected because in the in the local case, if you just look at the same equation in a ball in C2, then you can easily write down solutions that are not smooth with the boundary data perfectly smooth. Uh, so, here. so keep in mind this, uh, say, U, U of a Z1, Z2 on the unit ball in C2 to be, say, the max between Z1 squared minus a half plus squared and Z2 squared minus a half plus squared. So this function U on the unit ball solves uh, a similar Dirichlet problem. So it's plurisubharmonic. The, the DD bar U squared is zero. And uh, the boundary data is completely smooth, real analytic even. But this function is uh, only C11. It's not C2. However, this is just a local example. And uh, it's not clear how you actually construct a counterexample, but it was done. And then later, uh, Darvash and Lampert in 12, they proved that, in fact, IDD bar phi, in general, has coefficients which are not continuous. So coefficients are not C0. So um, it seems like it's almost optimal here. You have the DD bar phi is bounded, but in general, it's not continuous. OK, so the, the the question which was left is about the actual C11. So the, the problem was, is this geodesic phi in C11 of x cross sigma, which means, again, that the, the, the full real Hessian is bounded. So um, this is a, would be, in some sense, the optimal regularity. So it's the only thing I can think of reasonably that you can put between this and this. <laughs> And, uh, um, and again, by local examples, such as this one, you do have C11, and you don't have anything better. So this problem had been studied before. So Bwotsky uh, in the same paper in 09 proved that the answer is yes if the uh, bisectional curvature of this uh, x omega is semi-positive. So if the, if the background killer metric has semi-positive bisectional curvature, then it's fine. However, from the work of a mock here, we know that uh, these manifolds are quite restricted. So you can essentially classify them. And, uh, and uh, um, Robert Berman in, uh, what is it, 14, proved that uh, if, if it's, uh, you are in the polarized situation, so So if the, if the killer class is actually the first class of an ample line bundle, so the manifold is actually projective, then uh, you have almost have this. You have the, the, the phi t, the, the manifold slices of this solution are C11 on x for all t. So it's certainly a very good indication that the answer should be yes in general. And uh, um, Maybe later I will say something about the proof of these two. So now I'm in trouble because I need to push this down, but that will cover what I just wrote. Uh, maybe I wait uh, 10 seconds. <laughs> OK. OK. <laughs> so it will come back later. <laughs> OK. So the, the, the first theorem that we proved uh, last year is that uh, the answer is yes in general. So in general, this phi is indeed in C11. So you do have the expected optimal regularity for these geodesics. Uh, and uh, um, so therefore, basically, in general, this is the best you can do, and uh, no better than this. So um, before I <laughs> say something about this, I want to go to the second problem. Yes, so there was a first problem, which was this. And the second problem, which is uh, very much related, but slightly different, 
which is again about a, a similar purist of harmonic envelopes when there is no boundary condition. So this is the, uh, again, this would be a compact killer manifold without boundary. And let's say V, a smooth function on X, which we think of as the obstacle. In fact, C infinity here, you can certainly relax to C11, one one, but just <laughs> to keep you more comfortable, let's just keep it smooth. Um, and uh, so the, the envelope with the obstacle V is defined very similarly to before. U of X is the soup, again, overall eta, where eta is omega plus subharmonic on X, and eta is bounded above by V. This time, everywhere on X. So the earlier envelope that was covered, it had a similar condition only on the boundary. Now there is, there is no boundary, and you just require that it lies below everywhere. So the, this is also called sometimes um, Sichak uh, global extremal function in the pluri, pluri potential theory literature. And the picture of this uh, U, at least the real picture, which is, of course, easier to draw than the complex picture, if, the, if the, this is the obstacle V, which I drew as kind of not really convex, so V is not really omega PSH, then the envelope is like the convexification of V, or plurisubharmonification, omega PSHification of V. So you can see that the, the, there is a region where u is strictly less than v, where it looks like a linear function, at least in this picture. And then there is the region where they're equal, which is here. OK, so um, this is a very natural object to consider. And here are some relatively easy properties of this envelope. So easy properties. So first of all, u is also omega plus harmonic on x is bounded. u is less than or equal to v also. So u, in fact, participates to this, <laughs> participates to this envelope here. And uh, on the set where u is strictly less than v, we have that omega plus td bar u to the n is zero. So again, U may not be smooth, at least we don't know. So this is in the sense of Bedford-Taylor, again, in the weak sense, because it's bounded, this makes sense. And this is just uh, naively explained by this picture here, right? <laughs> it's linear, so the second derivative is zero. So it's the nonlinear version of that fact, yes. So the, the Montjamper is zero. And uh, also, of course, it won't be zero in general, away from this contact set. And the, the, I mean, you can see, morally speaking, it will be the same as omega plus td bar v to the n. We will say it later. And also, u has minimal singularities in the sense of the MAE. In this class, so which means that, that for every eta omega pluris subharmonic, eta is bounded above by u plus c for some c. So on x which is obvious by this uh, definition as envelope. And this is the, the minimal singularity. So any other omega plus harmonic function is more singular than u in this sense. OK, and again, the problem is what is the regularity of u? And uh, so we can also consider a slightly more general setup. So, so far I just took omega killer metric here, but in, you can uh, loosen this restriction. So let me quickly mention this. So we can also replace, so the, we can replace Omega in this construction of U, or in the definition of U, 
by, let's call it uh, theta, which would be a general closed smooth real 1 1 form on x. So theta would be a closed real 1 1 form. So it defines a cohomology class with this bracket. Uh, a 1 1 cohomology class. And uh, um, again, following Demailly, who <laughs> was inspired by similar definitions in algebraic geometry, we say that theta is, so this class is, OK, the first one you already know. So Kähler class is just the obvious thing. If there exists a phi smooth function such that theta plus td bar phi is positive, so the, here, this uh, H11 class, I'm viewing as closed real one forms modulo the image of IDD bar in the usual way. And uh, we will say that the class is NEF, a numerically effective, if for any epsilon there exists a phi epsilon smooth, such that theta plus DD bar phi epsilon is bigger than minus epsilon omega on x. So almost semi-positive. And uh, pseudo-effective, PSEF, if there exists a phi omega plurisubharmonic, sorry, theta plurisubharmonic, so theta plus dd bar phi, semi-positive in the weak sense. So this, this phi may not be smooth. And the big, if there exists a phi theta plurisubharmonic, such that furthermore is strictly strictly theta plurisubharmonic. Again, in, in the weak sense. So um, what the Demaini proved is that these, these definitions in the projective case are uh, perfectly consistent with the same de definitions with the same names in algebraic geometry. So if x projective and uh, uh, theta is a C1 of a line bundle, then the class is scalar if and only if the line bundle is ample. The class is nef if and only if the line bundle is nef. The class is pseudo-effective if and only if the line bundle is pseudo-effective. And the class is big. So these are equivalent to the algebra geometric definitions. OK, so uh, at least you have this. Uh, um, relatively simple transcendental or analytic concepts that generalize algebraic concepts. Furthermore, um, uh, in this case here, so this, this guy here I will call a killer current. So uh, theta plus dd bar phi, which may not be smooth, but with a strict positivity is called a killer current. And uh, again, by the fundamental domain regularization theorem, of current implies that, okay, in words, implies that if, if you have a big class that exists a Kähler current, you can change it. You can regularize this phi and find a new Kähler current with analytic singularities, which maybe I don't need to define. But uh, the consequence of that is that if I define the non Kähler locus of this class, non Kähler locus, as the intersection of the singularities of t for all t Kähler current in the class theta. So this is a non-trivial non intersection only when the class is big. Then if the class is big, so say theta is big, otherwise you get everything. Then this one here is a proper closed analytic subset or analytic subvariety. So this is the This follows crucially from the domain regularization. So the non kähler locus is, in fact, always an analytic subset. And in the case of a line bundle, this is the well-known uh, augmented base locus, B, B plus of L, when theta is C1 of L and, and the, the manifold is projective. OK, so OK, with this concept, so the point is that the non kähler locus means that on the complement, the class behaves like a killer class. What it means, it means that, maybe I just say it in words, <laughs> that you can actually find a killer current, which is a smooth killer metric on the complement of the non-killer locus. 
So uh, in fact, you can find, as I said, one killer current or many of them, <laughs> which are actually smooth and killer matrix away from this set. So on the complement, the class looks like killer, but there are some singularities of this killer current on this locus. OK, so now <laughs> with, this, with these definitions under the belt, <laughs> we, can, we can generalize or the second setup. So the so now if theta is uh, as before and v a smooth function, you can let u of x to be totally the same the same envelope. The same envelope. So again, for them to be any element in this is necessary and sufficient that the class is a pseudo-effective. So, so theta here should be at least pseudo-effective. Otherwise, this is empty, and then you just get minus infinity. OK, so, uh, so again, maybe I guess some people put the theta here to emphasize really it would be theta and v. But I, I, I will drop them from the notation, but they're, they're implicit there. OK, so the same question is, what is the regularity of this envelope? OK, so the, the first result, I believe in general, was uh, due to Robert Berman in his thesis. So he proved that if, uh, if uh, theta is uh, C1 of L, where L is a big line bundle, as I said, the same as just saying that this is a big class, and it's the first chain class of line bundle, then <coughs> U is uh, C11 on compact sets away from this non killer locus. So it's, uh, um, again, the number C11. Lock just means on, on compact sets, on every compact set. And uh, um, he conjecture that at least if uh, theta is a killer class, then uh, U is in C11. OK, so this was uh, back in his thesis. Here he used a, a very nice modification of a method of Bedford Taylor. Yes, yes. Are you using a postdoc? Really? Oh, okay, okay. So the I mean it's published in O9, but uh, it's uh, okay. Yeah, very good. <laughs> very good. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then the so <laughs> the next general result indeed is due to Berman and Demai. So this one was also the postdoc or later. Uh, Maybe later, yes. This one, maybe 11, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so if, uh, if theta is big, but doesn't necessarily come from a line bundle, then uh, you get almost the same. So C1 alpha locally away from this non killer locus. Again, for all these results, the, the obstacle V can just be C11, and nothing changes. But for simplicity, as I said, it's just stated with smooth. And uh, um, more recently, Robert has a, a new approach that I will mention, hopefully later, which uh, deals with the case of Neff, Neff and Big classes. So this was maybe 13. So if theta is Neff and Big, then u is in C, one alpha log. So it seems like a strictly weaker result than this, but the method of proof is completely different. Uh, and it's quite interesting. So I, I, I will explain it. And again, these, uh, in general, these envelopes are, again, no better than C11. So they're not C2 in general. So uh, still, OK, here at least you do have the C11. Here you see it's already conjectural. And uh, um, the question was whether you could get C11 in general, without line bundles, without the class being, say, rational. So the, the, the theorems are as follows. So this was myself and also Chu and Joe at the same time, <laughs> is that if, if the class is scalar, then U is indeed C11. So the, that uh, confirms this conjecture here. So this is now 
okay? And, uh, and uh, more recently, this one here is uh, almost on the archive, but not yet, is that the, the, if, uh, if uh, theta is nothing big, then you get the same as, uh, as in Robert's original result. So then U is in C11 lock. So again, this improves on, say, this result because you don't have a line bundle, and this one because you get one, but here you don't have NEF. And, uh, and in these results, NEF is kind of crucial, actually. So, so, so if you want to remove NEF from this blackboard, you need a new idea, for sure. Um, OK, so these are the, the results. And let me discuss the idea. So as I said, there are these two setups. And um, there is also an application, actually, of this last result to the C11 regularity of geodesic rays. So instead of a geodesic segment, which joins two points, a geodesic ray starts at the killer potential and goes to infinity. So we also proved that for geodesic rays that come from test configurations in the sense of Donaldson, then you have the same C11 regularity locally. Uh, maybe I don't write it, but, uh, but uh, you do have a similar application to geodesics. And uh, um, in fact, it works also for transcendental test configurations in the sense of uh, Dierefeld and uh, Dervan Ross. OK, so the, what are the ideas or the strategy, or not even strategy, the, the beginning of the proofs are a similar, well, OK, not really similar, but there are these two setups, and there is an uh, approximation scheme. So start by approximating phi or u by smooth functions, which solve a family of Monjamper equations, which are non-degenerate. with a parameter, and then the parameter is going to go to some limit, and you will obtain phi or u in the limit. So the, the, the first setup, this is quite classical from the paper of Chen. These are called epsilon geodesics. So you fix epsilon positive, and you look for phi sub epsilon, so smooth. So now we're in the setup of the first, the first setup, solving uh, you can call it a elliptic regularization, elliptic regularization of the equation we had before. So you can make this smooth, strictly positive on x cross sigma, and then solving a non-degenerate motion per equation, essentially epsilon times the, the volume form. So this one here, dz, dz, dz bar high, is the usual volume form on, on the annulus. And this one is the killer volume form. So this is a strictly positive, smooth volume form. And uh, the same boundary data. Mm -hmm. So the, this epsilon geodesic is a non-degenerate, strictly elliptic problem with boundary. And this one can be solved. So this was proved by Chen and this uh, Kaffarelli con Nirenberg Sprock, Boguan, Plosky. They proved that there exists a unique phi epsilon smooth solution. And uh, the, you have a uniform bounds. <laughs> See if I can write them here. So many quantities are bounded. So the L infinity norm, the gradient. gradient, the Laplacian, and the C11 on the boundary. They're all bounded above by a constant independent of epsilon. 
So here I'm not specifying the metric that I use to measure these various norms and derivatives. It's always the product metric, pi star omega plus this, the obvious product metric on, the, on this product. And uh, furthermore, as you can imagine, this phi epsilon converge to the geodesic when phi goes to zero. Okay, let's write it here. <laughs> phi epsilon converge to the geodesic phi as epsilon goes to zero in the C1 alpha topology for any alpha between zero and one. This follows just from this last line and a simple, simple limiting argument. I mean, morally speaking, <laughs> epsilon goes to zero, so in the limit this is zero. And this tells you that <laughs> C1 alpha nor norm of phi epsilon is uniformly controlled, and then Ascori Arzala will give you a convergence subsequence. So this is actually how you prove the theorem of Chen, that you do have a C11 bar solution. It's in this way. And uh, the main theorem then is simply to establish the similar estimate in the inside. So this is only on the boundary. The real Hessian is only controlled on the boundary here. And it's actually now controlled in the inside as well. So, uh, so what we show is that the that the, the, the soup over x cross sigma of this uh, double square phi epsilon, fun, let's see, independent of epsilon, which passing to the limit easily implies that the limiting phi is C11. This implies. And uh, so, in fact, the theorem, if you want the more technical, statement is like this. So it's just simply an estimate for the non-degenerate complex modular pair equation, possibly with boundary. So this is a compact manifold with boundary, maybe. Boundary, possibly. But it doesn't have to have boundary. And the uh, f and phi smooth functions, such that phi is a Kähler potential. Whatever. Uh, that's not even matter. And the 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 Mont-Jamper equation is satisfied. So now the right hand side is smooth and positive, and uh, then there exists a constant c, which depends on many things. <laughs> Namely, okay, so on the on the soup of f, on the soup of the gradient, on the inf of the Hessian with the obvious meaning of this, <laughs> and uh, on the soup of phi, on the soup of the gradient, and on the soup on the boundary of the Hessian. If the boundary is non-empty, otherwise you can drop the last, and such that the, 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 the real Hessian of phi is bounded by this constant C. So if you want some essentially interior interior estimate for the real Hessian of the solution of a complex Mont-Jamper equation. This is exactly the same setting as the famous Yao's theorem, Calabi conjecture, completely the same. The key point <laughs> is that the, the, the C doesn't depend on the inf of F. Right, so F is allowed to go to minus infinity. And uh, the reason why this is useful is pretty obvious. You just apply to so derive the theorem in the first line. You just apply the theorem in the second line with the following choices, right? So the, the you just take uh, m to be x cross sigma closure, and uh, omega. Okay, so this omega would be pi star omega plus uh, dz dz bar, and uh, phi phi epsilon minus mod z squared. So I, I remove mod z squared, which is harmless, so that when I do this plus td bar this, I get, up oh, it's gone, uh, somewhere underneath, <laughs> I get pi star omega plus td bar this. And then f, I take log epsilon, essentially, up to some constant. Right, so, so if I make these choices, and this equation 
here becomes the same as this uh, epsilon geodesic e equation. And log epsilon is very good because uh, uh, the soup is bounded, epsilon is going to zero. These are all zero. However, crucially, the inf goes to minus infinity. So uh, if you prove the same estimate depending on the inf, then it's useless for this point. And in fact, this estimate depending on the inf is very easy to prove. So, so kind of classical, and in any sense, definitely observed by Blotsky in 09. But uh, uh, for the regularity of geodesics, the dependence on the inf is not allowed. And uh, um, so that's the idea. Probably I don't have much time to say how you prove this, but I will say something later. I want to say something about number two, right? The, the, the envelopes. So here, use a different, different approach. Right, so the, the, again, in the blackboard behind, <laughs> to, to approach the geodesic problem, you added this epsilon on the right-hand side, elliptic regularization. That works because the manifold has boundary. Here, for problem number two, the envelope, you, the right-hand side, the, if the manifold doesn't have a boundary, you can't just put any constant you want here because you have to integrate to the correct amount. So you can't just copy the same idea. So uh, what Berman found, so zero temperature limit. So this is an idea that you can find already in, uh, in earlier work on real motion pair by Kim in the obstacle problem, and even earlier in the hamilton jacobi equations, other people, is to, to d do this following. So for beta positive, solve omega plus td bar phi beta to the n equals to e to the beta phi beta minus b. So this now we're in the setup number two. The manifold doesn't have a boundary, this is on x. Uh, or you can put here theta if you want. Uh, let's just do the Keller class. Let's just do the Keller class. So uh, in a Keller class, this equation here for beta positive, uh, so this is a fixed guy, okay, with beta. This is the same phi, but it has the correct sign, positive. So this is solvable. So there exists a unique smooth solution, phi beta, by the fundamental work of Oban and Yao. This is the easier Monchamper equation <laughs> with a positive coefficient. And then what uh, Robert observed, is if you let beta go to plus infinity, then the phi beta converge exactly to the envelope u. In, okay, certainly L infinity of x. In fact, what he proved is even C1 alpha x in the setting here of a Kerr class. And then what we prove is that the, the C11 norm of these approximations is uniformly bounded, independent. Oh yes, the zero temperature, that this has come from some statistical mechanics uh, interpretation of this. The temperature is one over beta. So <laughs> beta to infinity means temperature goes to zero, whatever temperature means. <laughs> so that explains, that explains, ask Robert, of course, <laughs> if you want to know more. <laughs> and the, 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 the theorem, so with the, 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 the people before, I mean, in the case of a Kera class, is myself and then independently Chu and Joe, and then for Neff and Big, you change this a little bit with this, uh, th all three people together, is that the soup of this uh, real S and phi beta specimen C, independent of beta. So this in the in the Kera class sense, and so this U is indeed in C11, and this again follows more or less from this result. <laughs> Not exactly because you, you, you also have here plus a beta phi. But then that, that's not a problem. So you just add the beta phi there. So I think time is a bit short. So let me just, uh, maybe just in, in minus one minute, give a corollary <laughs> of, of this, which indeed is, is due to Robert. Already? Oh, OK, OK. So in the three or five minutes, let me just say. <laughs> so if, uh, is uh, say Neff and Big or Kehler. I mean, Kehler is even easier, even stronger. Then uh, the you have this. Uh, if you integrate, so I already said that. Okay. Let me just write it first. So uh, this is really actually equal to the integral over x of theta plus t d bar 
u to the n. So if you look at this envelope with the obstacle v in this NFMB class, and you compute the total motion per mass, which makes sense in the sense of Bedford Taylor, but now you even know that it's okay. In the Keller case, it's C11. I didn't write it, but in the in the Neffen big class, is a C11 lock away from the non-Keller locus. You can still compute this if you want to remove the non-Keller locus. So, as I said much earlier, <laughs> this is zero on the away from the contact set. So then you only here you can replace it directly with u equals v. And now on the set where u equals v, naively you can replace u with v. Right? It sounds kind of obvious. <laughs> but of course, uh, to do it, you need some regularity. So in particular, if you have C11 or C11 lock, it's pretty straightforward to replace u with v uh, just by elementary results in measure theory. And then uh, this one here is equal to this, essentially by Stokes' theorem. This is also the volume of alpha, in, so the theta. So you get this. Uh, volume formula, uh, which was also done by Perman de Mailly in a more general case of uh, big classes. So it's just a, it was already proved by Robert, but now that you know C11, the proof is easier somehow. So you, you, you can give an even easier, easier proof. Okay, so in, in one second, <laughs> let me say the punchline for this. Right? So this is the main point of the talk. Um, and uh, uh, as I said in the abstract, actually, this estimate even works in the almost complex case that may be slightly exotic. So the, 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 the main, maybe I just call this main theorem. Main theorem, and in fact, the corresponding Calabi-Yau type theorem even holds on compact, almost complex manifolds. I guess I would have to say precisely what it means, but probably I won't have time. The point actually is kind of strange because we, we actually proved this first in the almost complex case, which is much harder. So this takes about 20 pages of, of suffering. And then later we realized that in the Keller case, it simplifies a lot. And it also gives this results about geodesics and envelopes. So th then in the Keller case, the proof is considerably shorter. Um, but it, it even holds in, in much greater generality. And uh, the idea uh, of, of the main theorem is to bound the largest eigenvalue, lambda 1, from above, with a constant depending on the stated stuff, where this is the largest eigenvalue of this Hessian with respect to G. Okay, So the largest eigenvalue is a well-defined function. It's, in general, only a Lipschitz function, um, but it's OK. And if you bound it from above, then, uh, because the trace, the trace of the Hessian is the Laplacian, and the Laplacian is bigger than minus n, because it's omega pluris harmonic. So once you bound the Lagrangian value from above, you, you deduce that the real Hessian is bounded above and below. Okay? So this follows immediately from this, plus the fact that phi is a, a killer potential. And to prove this, uh, you apply the maximum principle to some quantity like log of lambda 1, let's just call this lambda 1, plus some function of the norm of grad phi squared, let's just stop it. then minus uh, a phi for some a sufficiently large. <laughs> so um, this h is some function of one real variable that you need to choose properly, properly chosen. a, as I said, is very large, but uniform. And uh, log of lambda 1, of course, is only defined on the set where lambda 1 is positive. But that's fine, because we want to an upper bound. So you can assume that you're working where lambda 1 is large. And, uh, um, the interesting point, the only point I want to say, so the maximum principle means you apply the Laplacian of the solution metric. This is omega tilde. You apply the Laplacian to this big quantity. Of course, as I said, you cannot, because lambda 1 is only Lipschitz. So the Laplacian doesn't make sense. <laughs> you can fix it in many ways. For example, in the viscosity sense, you can fix it. The original fix was by, by picking a point and a vector that maximizes the Hessian at that point and extending the vector in a neighborhood smoothly to a unit vector and looking at the Hessian on that vector. Turns out that what I just said is <laughs> not good enough. So, um, 
doesn't give you enough positive terms. So the, the way to fix, this was the approach, approach of Bwatsky, and you run into trouble unless the curvature is not negative. So the new idea is instead you just uh, modify this matrix a little bit, slightly, actually not really slightly, you modify it by some amount so that the largest eigenvalue is uh, one dimensional for the new matrix, and then it, be, it, it varies smoothly near the point. And then you take differentiate that. You get crucially some new good terms. So by just really looking at lambda one, you have new good terms, and the new good terms are the key. <laughs> okay, probably I stop here. Thank you. Thank you.